Hello, hello everyone. Good afternoon, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you're dialing in from today, you are very welcome. Sending people into the chat, into the room. Hi guys, good to see you. Wow, loads of people, fantastic. Great to see everyone, super excited for today's session. One of my favorite topics, habits, one of my favorite areas, the brain-based neuroscience element. I can't wait to work with you on this. As ever, make yourself comfortable, get yourself set. If you need a drink of water, have something to take notes on, just get everything ready so you can really zero in on, on you. I tell you what, I'm delighted to see so many of you today. We've had a little bit of a communication mix up the last uh, week or two. For those of you watching right now on replay and thinking, hey, I didn't get an invite to that. I would like to go gone to that session. That's my bad. I apologize. We will sort it out for next time. We're tweaking the way that we communicate the TSP live sessions. But you know what? Like I said, I apologize, but I'm going to double down on today's session, make sure we really deliver some great insights some things that are going to really move you forward for those of you that are here live and for those of you who are watching on replay. And while we're all getting set, one or two people still coming in. I'd love you all just to ah, take a really deep breath and just calm your mind, slow yourself down. It's going to be so relevant to what we talk uh, about and work on today. Um, turn off any distractions. You know, the brain is an attention economy. We get what we focus on. It can only look at so many things at once. So switch off the phone, social media, news, any other pings, dings, and alerts. And please do have pen and paper to hand. Pen and paper really is your second brain. The brain is great for having ideas, not so good for holding them. And let's just start with a little exercise that I like to call clearing the space. And I'd love everyone to take a refreshing breath, settle into your seat. And I'd like to take you through a four step process. And the first step is simply to notice what's on your mind right now. What's top of mind? What are you thinking about? What do you see that is just always on your mind? It's maybe a recurring thought right now. Maybe it's something that's you know, mildly anxiety inducing or something that's like a little bit of a concern, just keeps coming up again and again. And what I'd like you to do is acknowledge it very simply, very succinctly to yourself. No emotional charge. It's like, hmm, just noticing. I'm thinking about you know, this thing I've got coming up next week that's uh, a worry or something that happened last week and I'm not quite sure about what the outcome was or is going to be. And then what I'd like you to do is label the emotion that's attached to the thought. Okay, can't have a thought without a feeling or a feeling without a thought. So what's the emotion there? And I want to encourage you to do this in a word. Okay. It's going to be anxiety, apprehension, um, worry, stress, excitement, whatever it might be. Just label the emotion. No story, no big long on, long run on uh, internal narrative. Just like, what's the feeling there? And then in whatever way works for you, I'd like you to park it. Sweep it away, stick it in the drawer, put it up on the shelf. Just whatever mentally gives you permission to let that go for now and focus on the things that we have in front of us. Okay, now that exercise is called clearing the space. Very simple four step process. Notice what's in the background, acknowledge it very succinctly, label the emotion and park it. And it's really useful just to clear out the mind. It's something we're gonna talk about in a short while. But for now, I'm respectful of everyone's time. So let's really get into the meat of today's session. So welcome to this month's TSP Live, 12 brain-based success habits to accelerate your project and shift you to the next level by elevating performance, increasing productivity, and just letting go of some of that stress and overwhelm. You know, I've always believed that the brain-based element, it's a game-changing differentiator. It really is something a little different. It plays a big role in the key area that comes into play with everything that you do. And it's something that nobody else is paying good attention to. So it's going to be a real game changing differentiator. And I also find that the neuroscience angle will always complement and extend and deepen everything else you're doing. If you've got other personal professional dev going, if um, you've got projects where you're working on skills or character, if you are stepping up to the next level in promotion and you've got some new challenges, whatever else you're working on. The neuroscience angle is going to complement, extend and deepen that. That's why I love this stuff so much. And I'm also just thinking, you know, habits. I hope that doesn't sound too parochial for some of us. It's like, you know, guys, then we always talk about habits. Everyone else is looking at habits. Is that really where we want to spend some time? But you know what? 
habits are just one of the greatest things to become a master at, to become proficient at, to become a total badass at. Because habits are brain friendly. They are energy efficient. And they are super, super reliable. In a nutshell, habits are force multipliers. They have massive results with just little tweaks in our lives and the work that we like to do. And I've got a stack of habit books here that I'm going to be sharing with you, recommendations that I'll give to you at the end of today's session. And pretty much every single one of them has a subheading to that book that says something along the lines of tiny little changes here make these huge results over here. Those little tweaks are the habits that you install. Those massive results are whatever you want to point success at. So today's session is going to be perfect for you if, first of all, you're feeling a little bit rushed, a little bit overwhelmed. There's lots on. and I don't know where quite to place the focus. It's going to be perfect if you've got another level of productivity and focus you know is waiting for you, but you're maybe not hitting that gear right now. And this is going to be perfect if you're looking for something you can really lean on um, in times of difficulty. Uh, in circumstances that are challenging, when you're moving up to a new level, some new learning, stepping out of the comfort zone. And for those of us who want to create a world-class personal and professional life, this is going to be a perfect session because today really is about zeroing in on optimizing for both the brain and the mind. The mind, the thing that does the thinking of what we refer to as consciousness and the brain and impersonal body part, a bit like the heart, just does what it does. And it's useful to know how the brain works and some of the limitations because then we can optimize for that. And this is super important for all of us because first of all, everything begins with a thought. Maybe you'd like to jot that down in your notes. Everything begins with a thought. The feelings that we have about something when we get into an inspired moment, when we've got motivation for a task, when we make good decisions, all of those things begin with a thought. It really is the germ. It really is the genesis of everything that goes, goes on after. Second key reason this is super important is the world isn't wired for thinking space. You guys will have heard me talk about this in my brain-based leader course and other kind of brain-based neuroscience, neuroleadership stuff that I've done. The world isn't wired for thinking space. Take a look at your calendar. And the demands on your time. Take a look at personal professional development in large organizations, teaching loads of great stuff, leadership, communications, and so on. Where's the thing that teaches us how to reflect, how to meditate, to create thinking space, how to get into deep flow states? The world isn't wired for thinking space and doesn't really respect it. We've got distraction, we've got interruption, it's an always on culture. We're not really spending time teaching people how to think. So the world isn't wired for that thinking element and doesn't really value it. And here's the third reason why all of this is so important, because we are in challenging times right now. And to be honest, we'll be always be able to say that there'll always be something that kind of wants to push us into that threat state. And in those moments, there's a lot of uncertainty. And when we get that, that threat state impairs performance, especially in the human brain. And almost to add insult to injury, that uncertainty that's right outside the door or that's in our environment right now, it consumes our attention. The human brain is concerned with survival. It's monitoring the environment. And a huge amount of our attention is dedicated, has to be dedicated to those threat elements. So I'm in these challenging moments where, first thing, it's impairing my performance because of the uncertainty and the threat state that I'm in. And secondly, I just don't have as many resources to give over to the things that I want to focus on because my attention is consumed elsewhere with these challenges. Now, the mistakes that most people make is that, first of all, they undervalue the importance of thought. The second key mistake that we think and that comes up for us is that there's nothing we can do. There absolutely is. We want to value thought. We want to value the thing that does the thinking, the brain. And we want to know there are things that we can do. We can tailor our environment. We can approach the day differently. We can make new choices and decisions. And we can value the brain and how it works best. And that's going to be our focus today, prioritizing and optimizing for the thinking. And we're going to do that via habits because they're reliable, they're robust, they're brain friendly. And you know, I love that sense of combining the big project, the thing I'm really working on, the success I want to create with tiny habits, small changes that anybody and everybody can make. And with a little bit of consistency and commitment, two of my favorite words, we can really install major change. And we're going to have a focus today 
for simple but very impactful tools that you can install. I mean, literally this afternoon, tonight, tomorrow, for next week at work. You can use these things right away. In fact, I'd love it to be a theme for you today that you're thinking about the transformation rather than information piece. Here's some information, here's some data. Here's how I'm gonna apply it. That's the transformation piece. And like the very first exercise in today's session, clearing the space, here's an example, super easy to get focused. I use that at the beginning of every coaching session with my one-to-one -one clients. But you know what? That's not just for the coaching space. If you've got a project that you want to get some clarity around, if you've got, a talk that you're about to give at work. Let's say you're about to step into a team meeting. Let's say you need to knuckle down to a presentation or a business case you're about to write. Just take a moment to clear the space, use your second brain, pen and paper, jot down what's on your mind, label the emotion, park it, which is giving yourself permission to put it to one side, and then you can be really super focused. So today, three big takeaways. First of all, deeper appreciation for the thinking and that which does the thinking the human brain. That's job one. Takeaway number two, we're gonna learn how to install new habits and eradicate unwanted habits. How useful is that gonna be? And thirdly, we're gonna give you 12 success habits that are all geared towards the, the brain and to achieving high performance that really makes those projects come alive. So that we can, first of all, increase productivity, focus, effectiveness. We can dial up the inspiration and motivation. We can deepen relationships with those closest to us or those we need to collaborate with or those that we're new to. We're gonna instill some calm and some inner peace. And we're gonna work on the mission. Five big results that we can be looking for today. In short, a world-class personal and professional life that you absolutely adore, that's full of meaning and full of impact. And I mean, just imagine if you were focused, inspired, energized, your relationships were really working. You were calm on the inside and you were on mission. I mean, how would that help you? How would that feed your project? How would that feed your success? And what would that mean for those around you? Never mind the impact on you. What about the impact on those around you to be with someone, talking to someone, working with someone who's calm, who's collected, who's poised, who's focused and really making things happen? Now, for those of you that are live, I'd love you just to fire up the chat at the bottom of the screen, the chat bottom. Just drop me a note. Let me know what's going on for you. How are you feeling right now? What are you thinking? What are you noticing about the brain and the mind and how you want to set up to really optimize for that? And for those of us that are just watching this back, just take a moment to think, OK, how's that really going to serve me? And how good a job have I done of looking after the brain right now? And where could I make some tweaks? That's what we're going to be focused on today. So today's session, three big pieces. First of all, we're going to talk about habits. I'm going to talk to you about forming them, implementing them, deepening them. Secondly, we're going to talk 12 success habits, which really contribute to world-class performance. I could have chosen 100. I've really whittled it down to the 12 that I see as the ones that really make the difference, the real bang for buck. And the third thing we're going to do is we're going to optimize the schedule. So many of us just want to say that, OK, this is great. How does it work on the calendar? How does it work in real life? We're going to talk about that. And you know, today I want to say 100% achievable, 100% effective. Um, I remember a while back I was working with a client. She was a world leading magician. She still is. Um, amazing lady, does these amazing things. I didn't get to learn any of the secrets, I'm sad to say. Well, I like to keep the magical elements. I don't think I would want it to know. But I remember her asking me, Dan, you know, these kind of things you talk about, performance and these habits and brain-based elements, have they helped you? And I really had to stop and think because they 100% have helped me, but I almost don't notice it now because it's so dialed in. It's so much part of my DNA. There's no energy being spent there. I just find that I'm getting great results. And when I look into the detail of why, it's because I've installed these things. And just a final note before we really get into this, you might like to pay, um, you might like to pair today uh, and today's session with our monthly challenge this month, challenge number 205, February uh, 2022. It's all about holding bold boundaries. Holding a boundary is how you create your day and holding a boundary is such an important element to looking after the brain and the mind and making the space for the things that really elevate the thinking. Okay, now let's talk habits. Now, what do we mean by habits, first of all? Well, habits are essentially any repeatable behavior 
that is pretty much automatic and that the system sees as beneficial. OK, there's a part of me that sees there's a benefit here. And even if we stop and say, well, hold on a second, bad habits as well. Where's the benefit there? There will be a payoff. It'll be hidden. It might not be so obvious. Maybe it's two or three steps removed. Maybe it's a little warped when you bring it into conscious awareness. But there's a benefit there. There's a payoff. And maybe we've moved on beyond that. Maybe it's not paying us off as we would want it to in the ways that we would want it to. Maybe there's better ways to achieve it, but somewhere there's a benefit in there. And that automaticity, is that a word? That automatic nature of habits, that's because they reside in the deep circuitry of the brain. Okay, this isn't conscious brain uh, activity where thoughts come to be as language. This is way back in a far older part of the brain where we kind of hardwire those circuits. And to get a little bit of context around this, I want to start with three massive brain-based insights. And insight number one is that the brain hardwires everything that it can. Okay, and maybe you'd like to jot that down. The brain hardwires everything that it can. Um, and it has to. We have so much information to process and our working memories are so limited that the brain takes any repetitive or otherwise important thought or activity, and it kind of hard codes it into our far more capacious subcortex. So that's the part that holds you know, longer term memories and processes. So the you know, first thing is that the brain has to do that. So much information to process. Second reason that the brain hardwires what it can is it's an efficiency thing. Far less energy is required to think using very well-established, deeply ingrained, hardwired patterns than to think anew. I mean, just try it now for yourself. Let's, I'm gonna give you guys some sums, okay? And I'd love you just to say them out loud. Don't need to come off mute or anything, but just wherever you are, just do the sum and notice what you notice, okay? So one plus one equals two, correct. Well done, you all pass. One plus one equals two plus two equals, uh, 10 plus 10 equals, 156 plus 75 minus 37 equals. Now, I don't know if you notice, but in that moment, you're like, ooh, <laughs> not doing that. And maybe there's a little bit of an ego thing there, or maybe you could see it come in because he's like, Dan's obviously setting something up here. But do you notice there's a little bit of a mental step back? A little bit of, and you know what? That's a, that's a threat response. That's part of my system go, whoa, 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 whoa. This is, you know, this is thinking. And thinking costs resources, and I'm the brain, and I'm concerned with survival. And I don't know where my next resource hit is coming from. I'm just going to try and ignore that. So it's an efficiency thing here. It's far less energy hungry or energy consuming to use very well established deep ingrained hard wired patterns when i say to you one plus one equals you're not doing any thinking just you go into that get it to no problem two plus two equals four ten plus ten equals twenty there's no thinking going on there so it's an efficiency thing those hard wired circuits they are energy efficient they are brain friendly and to come at this from a different angle i love a I love this study. It was one of the first things I really read about with the human brain when I was starting to really study and become a brain-based uh, neuroscience-led leadership coach. And this study said that they were looking at elite sports people, and they noticed that the elite people were using significantly less of their brain whilst playing their sport than a non-elite sports people. Now, intuitively, you might think it would be the other way around. You would think, well, this person's a pro, their brain's going to be going crazy. But what they saw when they sort of, they, so they had brain scans for a pro uh, tennis player and then a pretty good amateur. And the amateur's brain activity was like really intense. And the pro was like really not, it was really calm. And it just goes to show that the brain's you know, preference there is for hard wiring. You've got a pro athlete who just knows this stuff inside out and they are just free flowing. And for those of you that know Timothy Galway's work and the inner game, that really fits with that self one, self two. Self two is just free flowing, knows what it's doing, just so easy in the motion. And then when we're learning something new or when we're not quite as good, we're having to work very hard, and especially up here, really doing a lot of thinking. So you know, our hard wiring is far more dependable and far more able to deliver results than our conscious brain. And that's what happens. That's what we train when we get really good at this. So what does all this mean? The, hard, the brain hardwires everything it can. Well, two things come, at least in my mind. First of all, given how dependable and performant our habits are, 
wouldn't it be great to ingrain some brain-based success behaviors and just have those as habit? Wouldn't it be great to have that in the toolkit? And the second thing that comes to my mind is that given how deeply hardwired we all seem to be, can we really then break out of autopilot? And this is an FAQ I've received so many times in the work I do, especially in neuro leadership spaces. And unsurprisingly, you know, lasting change takes a different effort, a different level of effort and a whole new approach. And the way to do that is not just to counter the brain's preference for, hard, for hardwiring, but to leverage it. Like how can I use this rather than fight against it? How can I turn it around so it becomes a real asset for me? OK, so take a couple of notes on where this might be useful for you, the brain hardwires everything it can. Okay, where's that gonna be useful? Where's that relevant for me right now? Let's move on to insight number two. It's practically impossible to deconstruct that hardwiring. You know, if you've got a habit there that's been ingrained, it's very difficult to unwire that. There are other things that we can do. We're gonna talk a little bit about that shortly, but let's start with this insight that it's practically impossible to deconstruct our hardwiring. Our connections define how we see and approach the world our perceptions, the choices we make, the results we create for ourselves. So to transform performance at work and in business and as a, uh, as a person who wants to be successful in all aspects of life, we need to modify our connections in the brain. But here's the bad news. It's practically impossible to deconstruct the hard wiring that's already set in there, meaning it's impossible to unwire those connections primarily because they're just too deeply embedded, but also because any attempt to maybe understand the source of a, let's say a bad habit, as is often the first instance. You know, if I've got a bad habit, it's like, well, okay, let's really look into this and break it apart and see what's going on. The problem with that is it just serves to deepen the very circuitry we're trying to undo. It's why problem thinking generally just finds more problems because it's like grooving that into the brain and really making that something that you know, I'm focusing on this, then that's gonna strengthen that circuit. So deep analysis isn't that helpful. A basic awareness, absolutely, that's a necessary first step. But it's then what we do after that initial awareness that's crucial. The key is not to try to you know, change the habit. It's far better to leave that where it is and create a whole new habit in the other direction, backed up by attention. Okay, so don't replace habits. So sorry, don't remove habits, replace habits. Have that as a little brain tattoo. I don't want to try and rid myself of my, not of my smoking habit. I want to work intensely at my non-smoking habit. Okay, so that's where we want to create a shift. So that was insight number two. It's practically impossible to deconstruct our hard wiring. Here's the good news. Insight number three. It's really, really easy to create new wiring. Everything we do, everything we think, influences the layout and connections of our brain. I'm sure you've all heard of neuroplasticity, amazing insight of not that long ago. And to find out that the brain is continually fine tuning its pathways. Now the upside of this finding is that we have extraordinary capacity for new connections. The next question then is how do we hardwire new behaviors? Now the science is showing that it's not that hard to bridge the gap between a new thought, which is essentially a map held in working memory, and a habit, which as we've been saying, is a map that's hardwired into the deeper parts of our brain. Now our brain is an attention economy. If we wanna hardwire a new behavior, we need to give it enough attention over enough time. So enough positive reinforcement and attention over a long enough period of time. But to embed the habit, the nature of that attention is super, super important. So to hardwire a new behavior, we need to give it the type of attention that makes links to different parts of the brain so that the web really thickens and spreads out. So instead of just thinking about an idea, we need to write it down. We need to research it. We need to talk to other people about it. We need to take an action. We need to experiment. We need to see how we can link it to other things. And I love to play this game with clients when they say, listen, here's the thing I'm thinking of working on. And I say to them, well, why would that be good? Why else would that be good? What else could that lead to? How could this help to other parts of your, of your, um, your goal map? How could this work with other elements of the project you're working on? How could this work in other parts of life? And they really light up with this idea. So it's not just thinking about an idea, but it's taking lots of different types of action because these types of activities give our new map depth and density. Jot those two words down. If I've got an insight, 
which is you know a great moment. You know those insights are. Like, <gasps> I know what I should do. I know exactly what I should do. That's an insight. And it feels good. You remember the times you have those, it feels good. That's the, there's a reason it feels good. The brain and the human system wants to pay attention to that. That's something to pay attention to. And these are powerful. And these ideas are you know, often great moments of inspiration. That's why I love to have my journal with me all the time so I can capture ideas. But they're fleeting. They go. They're lost. That's why I want to jot them down. That's why I want to give them attention. That's why I want to build something, an ecosystem around them. So I'd love you just to, maybe in your notes, write down the word insight, put it in a nice little thought bubble, and then put around that depth and density, because that's what's going to move a thought or an insight into an ingrained habit. Now, if we put enough energy into any idea, it will become part of our world and part of our performance. It's two corollaries there. The first thing is that we want to really make sure that we do that idea of putting energy and density and depth into ideas but we also want to be very specific about which ideas we put that energy into else we end up with the bad habits that we say we don't want so three big brain-based insights to help set us up the brain hardwires everything it can it has to there's so much information to process the bad news it's practically impossible to deconstruct the how our hardwiring but the good news, it's really easy to create new wiring. I'd love you just to drop into the notes or into your, you know, just take a moment privately just to think, okay, what's the relevance of this for me right now? We're going to be working a little in this session on that. We're going to bring these ideas into a very real world practical element. But I'd just like you to take a private note right now. Why is this going to be useful? How is this going to change up how you approach performance, how you approach your day, how you approach communication or relationships or your project as a whole? The brain hardwires everything it can. It's practically impossible to deconstruct that hardwire and it's really easy to create new wiring. That last one, pay particular attention to. Okay, let's move on. Let's talk a little bit about forming habits. Now, the biggest question that comes up when we talk about forming habits is how long does it take? Dan, how long does it take to form a habit? And there is a whole bunch of research on at least three, four, five different clusters of answer to that. But I wonder if that's the right question to ask. I mean, does it really matter how long it's going to take? It's like this isn't a job to get through. This is something to get into. This is something that's going to really serve me. So I don't really want to worry so much about how long it'll take. But maybe what I do want to ask is I want to notice, I want to, I want to think about the quality attention that I get. So it's not like, how long is it? It's not so much a matter of time as it is of quality attention. That's what we're looking for. So from the brain-based view, and you know, there's lots out there already on how to form habits. You can go look that up yourself. That's no problem. Let me give you the brain-based view that will really complement um, and extend a lot of the advice out there. And the first is, awareness i'd love you just to write that word down when i'm looking to form a habit i want an awareness of it so I, what we're looking to do here is to identify it and to name it okay that's important give it a name and that's where we're going to stop with awareness i've noticed that um you know i've, I've got a habit of not really prioritizing the week and i want to name that and i want to then just think, okay, now I'm going to work with this. Because if I start to really analyze it, then that really brings in a lot of a time and attention on the thing that I don't want, the fact that I don't prioritize the week. So I'm going to name that, and I'm going to call my new habit, just an example, my new habit in the opposite direction, I'm going to call it weekly business admin. Yep. Maybe you'd like to call it weekly prioritization review. This is your new habit. You've given it a name. You've got the awareness. You've named it. That's it. Let's move on from there, because otherwise I'm going to get into a lot of analysis on the thing that I don't want, and that's the wrong kind of attention. Second thing I want from the brain-based view when it comes to forming habits is to think about impact. Okay, so get clear on your relationship with the habit that you don't want. Okay, so we're not talking here about um, going into a lot of analysis. We're talking again, just talking about what's the impact. Let's say I don't prioritize my week. What's the impact of that? And get clear on the relationship that you have with the habit that you do not want. Okay, so what's the impact? Well, the impact is I go into my week not really focused. The impact is I'm not quite sure what to work on. The impact is I go into my week a little bit stressed. 
a little bit like you know nervous anxious kind of dreading it because i'm just not feeling prepared i'm not feeling like i've got this thing together so awareness impact third piece is commitment okay this is key this is about acknowledging our willingness to change simple question here are you willing to make a change now don't skirt over this question don't just give it an automatic yes i can think of so many times in private one-to-one -one sessions where i say to somebody are you willing to make a change here and they've just spent two three four minutes telling me of this you know, impact of this habit this repeatable behavior the thing they're doing that they just don't want and i say okay are you willing to make a change here and they say well of course and i always get them to back up so just hmm, can i just check in on that because if it was of course i'm willing to make a change then maybe we wouldn't even be having this conversation because maybe it wouldn't even be an issue for you so are you willing to make a change there is a shift that i need to make there I've noticed, I've brought into awareness this bad habit. I need to make a conscious commitment, which we know as high performers is a decision. Okay, it's a decision, incision to cut, decision gone. Get rid of all other options, plan A only. Commitment. I want us to acknowledge the willingness to change. Am I willing to commit? Yes, I am. Then I can move forward. So when it comes to forming habits, I want you to think a little bit about the quality of attention that you're giving to your new habits. I would love you to have an awareness of the habit you want to rid yourself on. And let's name this area. I'd love you to understand the impact so that you're clear on your relationship to the habit. And I'd love you to get a little bit of commitment going, really acknowledging a new willingness to change. And it's got to be a step change. Because everything else I've been saying, yeah, yeah, I want to get rid of this habit, hasn't been working today. So, new level of commitment. Okay, now let's step into the habit loop. If people have questions, drop them into the chat. Um, but I'm going to keep going, and then you guys can let me know if there are things we want to go back over. Okay, now let's talk about the habit loop. Incredibly um, popular, well known, popularized by Charles Duhigg. I'm pointing over there because it's, I've left that book on the shelf, but the other books I want to share with you over here. And we're going to say four parts to the habit loop. Okay, so most, most of us think of a habit as a particular behavior. I bite my nails. I eat donuts at 11 o'clock every morning. Okay, but there are four pieces to the habit. And the first is the cue or the trigger, the thing that kicks it off. It can be a thought. Could be a feeling, time of day, person, place, all sorts of little triggers in our day that kick off the habit. Okay, I'm actually going to jump to step three in the loop, which is the behavior. So there's a trigger, and then it kicks off a behavior. I eat donuts at 11, I bite my nails, I you know get distracted. There's a there's a behavior there. So cue into behavior. And off the back of that behavior, step four is I get a reward. Okay, there's some kind of payoff that we talked about. Cue, behavior, reward. Now, why am I step, why am I missing out point number two? Because as I go through the cue, behavior, reward, cue, behavior, reward, cue, behavior, reward cycle, I start to anticipate the reward that's coming. I'm thinking if I do this behavior, then I'll get this reward, which might be a sugar rush, it might be feeling good, it might be calming anxiety, it might be getting rid of, an, of, a, of a sense of uncertainty. And that gives me step two, which is the craving. Okay, craving, that's the engine room that keeps and sustains a habit. I have a cue, a trigger that kicks this all off. There's a craving, a feeling, an anticipation of the reward to come. I execute the behavior and I get a reward. Now, like I said, most people just think there's a behavior, but it really pays to understand four pieces, not one, four pieces to the habit loop. And they call it a habit loop because it's a circle. It just keeps itself, it kind of feeds itself. Now for top performers, like everybody on this call, and everyone in our community, I'd love you to really focus over the next few days and weeks on working on the cues, the triggers that kick off the habits. That's where everything starts. That's the genesis. That's the beginning. Okay, so focus on your cues. And then the second thing I'd like you to do is I'd like you to include plenty of reward. 
Now, why am I saying that particularly? Because I know you guys. I know high performing people just like you. I know ambitious, high potential people who want to make things happen. You guys skip over the reward. It's like, okay, done. Next, next, next. Now, what happens every time I say next and rush on to the next thing, and I'm only sharing this because, man, I have lived with this for years, still something I need to focus and work on. So I'm not showing anything right now. I'm not showing any challenges that I don't myself have. When we say next and rush on to the next thing, we are cutting out that key element of the habit. loop. We are robbing our system of the feeling of the good feelings that come of achievement. So I've just stepped through a behavior. I've got my result. Now I want to reward that. I had a little win today. Great. Find a reward. Maybe that reward is telling somebody. Maybe it's I'm going to a little tiny little purchase or a little treat that I've offered myself. I want to create that internal system so that it gets to know that every time I get a little bit of success, there's a little reward that comes with that because then I want to repeat it. So to really elevate performance in the habit space, I'd love you to focus on the cues and focus on the rewards. Now, why do we do this? Well, we want this brain-based approach. What do most people do? They focus only on the routine and they can't understand why they can't keep things going. They can't understand why they slip out of good habits and slip back into bad habits. Not enough attention on the cues, not enough attention on the reward. The routine, that bit will get done. The actions will happen. The decisions will happen. The behaviors will happen. Focus on the cues. Focus on the rewards. And I would love you just to take a pit stop here, maybe in your notes, maybe on the chat roll. I'd love you just to take a moment to really notice the insight here. Cues and rewards. Where am I not paying attention to the cues? What would be useful? Where could I see cues in my day that would really help me right now? And what am I doing with rewards? Am I doing that for me? Am I doing it for the people around me? Am I doing it for my team? Am I doing it for my collaborators? Am I doing it for my accountability partners? Well, how am I doing for cues? How am I doing for rewards? Make those things happen. Because if I want to instill change, I want to focus on what's around the behavior and the routine. I want to focus on the cues and the reward. That gives me this, that will give me the ecosystem to shift the behavior. Now, before we move on, I want you just to think a little bit about where is this helpful? Like right now, literally today, or this afternoon, or across this weekend, or into next week, where is this gonna be helpful? Because I can tell you, I can tell you, you can turn any behavior into a habit. One of the things I loved in my early coach training, I've, I've, I've coached in maybe three, four major coaching schools but the first school was the newer leadership institute i love the work they do and i'm a big proponent big supporter of their work and one of the things in our coaching model the whole framework was to take the work you do in a coaching session and turn that into actions that turn into results i loved that you could turn any action or any behavior into a habit we talked earlier about bringing it into awareness and giving it a name Given it something that I want, like I am identifying that and I want that. So just imagine that, you know, one of your behaviors might be, you know, I always notice that I do much better when I'm prepped for my meetings. Okay, it's great behavior. But what if that became a habit? I don't have to think about it. I don't have to spend a lot of energy on it. I'm just almost on autopilot. And it creates for me these great meetings. And somebody comes to me and says, Dan, how are you? You always seem to get a really great result from every meeting. Every, every time we step away, everybody's complete. Everyone knows what they're doing. It really moves things forward. We use the time wonderfully. What's going on there? I've created a habit. I don't notice it. I have to really think about it. Like when I talked with the magician, like, did these things help? Oh, yes, they do. But I had to really think about that because it's so ingrained. So where is this helpful for you right now? What behaviors do you want to turn into habits? Right. So someone on the chat roll, give me an example of something you're working on right now. Okay, thank you. Promotion. I'm working on, let's imagine I'm working on a promotion. Okay, what I'd love you to do is think, okay, I want to promote, get promoted to the next level. Okay, what would be some habits that would really elevate my promotion seeking journey? 
Okay, what would help me with that? What's a habit I could have? And something might be that, for example, really, um, so getting a sense of everything that's going on in the organization so I can be in the right meetings and get visibility with the right people. Okay, that kind of wider view and those deeper insights at the organizational level, let's make that a habit. Uh, I'd love to have the habit of communicating in a certain way when I'm in front of certain people. Okay, this is key because when I start to talk to leadership or power, uh, when I'm talking to people who are maybe two or three rungs above me and have the power, the uh, decision-making power to promote me, I want them to see me in a certain light. Okay, I'm going to create a habit which switches me in to a different level of communication which works for that level of the organization, that level of the conversation. Um, if I really want to move my promotion journey forward, one of the great things to do is understand the goals of my manager. If I can help my manager get their goals, I help they help me get my goals. If I can align what I'm doing with what my where my manager or my leader is going, I'm going to accelerate myself through this journey. So these are just arbitrary examples, but you notice how we can turn these into habits. Was that helpful, by the way? Thank you. I'm glad. So what is my project? What am I looking to achieve? What are the habits of that? Let's just take a moment to look at your next level. What does your next level of success look like? Think of that right now. What does your next level of success look like? Maybe it looks like greater revenues, bigger team, more responsibility, different kind of operating model, just operating at a brand new level. Okay, great. Now, what are the habits of someone at that level? What are the habits of someone at the level of success that you're looking for? And maybe you can think of someone, bring someone to mind, a role model of someone you really admire who has the success that you're looking for, or indeed your future self. Use your future self as your role model. It's one of my favorite games to play, to do a visualization where you see your role model, and that role model is you, let's say three to five years from now, with the success that you're currently working to create. Now, let's have a look at that person and think, what are their habits? What do you notice is just autopilot for them? And then from there, what are the triggers for that? And as a coach, one of my coaches, great coach, she's called you, said to me, um, have the future be a place you come from. Okay, so I can see my future and I can see the kind of habits that I would have in those moments. I want to bring that into the present moment because those triggers, they'll be there right now. And the behaviors or a version of them are probably in my day already. I want to dial those up. I want to turn those into habits so that, you know, let's say I've got a gamut of habits, maybe let's say 20 core habits. Maybe I just want to shuffle around what those are when I'm stepping up to the next level, because every level I ascend, there are some skills and habits and behaviors that I let go of. And there are some new ones that I adopt in their place, just the nature of the level I'm operating at. So look at your next level and ask yourself, what are the habits of that level? And what would be the triggers? I'd love you just to take a moment to really notice that, jot it down in your notes. Okay, let's get into a little bit of implementation here. Let's make things happen. So as we go through each of the 12 habits today, I'd like you to be thinking about how you can really implement this, how you can really make it work for you. And I'd like you to do three key things. So jot these down in your notes. This is a, a recipe, if you like, for how to form a habit, okay? And job one is to isolate the cue or the trigger, okay? Timing is absolutely key here. So when is the optimum moment? Great game to play here is to think of thing, habits you want to eradicate and go back and back and back and back and back and back until you find a real source and a real trigger. And anything you want to install, think ahead to that. Like, here's what I want to have happening here. Okay, here's the trigger. It's over here. But when I lose a procrastination battle, or a, let's say a distraction battle, meaning somebody calls me, I say yes, and I'm off on to something else. That battle isn't lost at that acupuncture point, although I could have made a different choice. It's probably lost way earlier when I failed to prioritize, failed to switch off my phone, wasn't dialed into my success. So the first thing I'd like you to do when it comes to implementing is isolate the cue or the trigger. And as we step through each of these habits, let's be thinking, what's my cue, what's my trigger here? Second thing I'd like you to do is awareness of the situation in which these habits come up and the reward that you're going to apply. And I really want you to experiment here. Okay, so this is a key, uh, this is a differentiating tip, if you like, is to really experiment with reward. 
reward is one of those areas where one person could say, well, you should buy a load of stuff for you and then some yourself and then somebody else tries that and it, it has actually the counter effect. So rewards is an area, at least in my experience, to really experiment with and find what works for you for that particular habit. Okay, and then the third piece is positive reinforcement. Yeah, to do it and to keep doing it, you need to positively reinforce that. And you'd love to do that yourself, but also with an accountability partner, something you can do for other people, something they can do for you, to give that positive reinforcement. Yeah, we wanna, we wanna catch ourselves doing things right, as opposed to punish ourselves for doing something wrong. We're looking for positive enforcement, reinforcement of the things that we want to see. My kids used to go to judo and the lady who ran that, she was a pretty imposing figure, very uh, wonderful person, brilliant um, martial artist, and just a great person. I really, I can't think of her name now, but really wonderful human being. A lot of command of the room. One of the things that she used to do, like, when you get the kids to sit down, they're all running around and rough and tumble and all the rest of it. And when the kids would sit down, she would praise the people who were sitting down rather than tell the kids who were still running around and off in the corner doing their own thing. And those kids would notice that and they'd be like, hey, I want a bit of that positive reinforcement. So they would quickly run over and sit down and then they get a little bit of praise. OK, super, in, super logical, super obvious, but we miss it in the moment. And that, you can, that goes for all three of these rules. OK, so we're going to isolate the trigger. We're going to give awareness and really experiment with the reward. And we're going to have positive reinforcement. That's your recipe for creating and installing and implementing habits. Okay, so any questions, drop them into the chat. But at this point, we're armed with a brain-based perspective on habits. And I'd love to share with you 12 habits that I consider absolutely fundamental. I gave myself three rules when I came up with these. Got a stack of cards here. Cannot wait to share. I gave myself three rules with these. Brain optimization was rule number one, okay? So if you do this habit, you will be brain friendly, okay? If you do this habit, you will be optimizing for the brain. It'll be uh, just a matter of course if you do this habit. Second rule I gave myself, I wanted bang for buck, okay? I wanted the most return because I know everybody's busy, everybody's focused, everyone's got lots of things on. So where do I get the most return? And specifically at the acupuncture points, the acupuncture points, those pivotal moments at a macro level, thinking of life and career, but at the micro level as well, how I start my day, how I transition through moments, how I finish my day. Okay, so I was looking for bang for buck. That was rule number two. And rule number three, I was really looking for the differentiators. Okay, I wanted the diff I wanted habits that were a little different from, let's say, the um, habits of, let's say, someone like Brendan Bouchard, great book. So first recommendation, High Performance Habits. Fantastic book, lots of good ideas, very practical, lots of research behind that. So I asked everybody and these, and then these, this is a collation of, the, of his findings, okay? So I wanted something a little bit different from the High Performance Habits, and I wanted something a little bit different from this other wonderful mainstay book, Stephen Covey, Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. What a brilliant book, especially for leaders and professional people out there. This is a great way to weave it into your professional life. But I wanted something a little bit different. So these are the differentiators, okay? I'm not gonna repeat what Brendan's come up with and what Stephen, as if I'm on first name terms with these guys. Um, I'm not gonna repeat that. We're gonna give you some differentiators, okay? So let's get into them as we go through. I'd love you to think a little bit about what's the opportunity here for me to use it. What's the trigger that I could use? And what would be the if then rule or system that would help me to really implement this, okay? Now I'm gonna rattle through these. If people have questions, drop them in the chat, put them in the comments of our post. And if there are things that people want us to come back to, we're definitely gonna follow up in later sessions. So let's get going. So. Brain-based success habit number one. The brain-based high performer clears the space, okay? Now this is the same process that we did at the beginning, okay? The conscious brain is incredibly easily consumed and full up, right? Logic used to, uh, sorry, the research used to say six, seven things that we could hold in our mind at one time, and now it's more like three or four. And we can only really do that for, you know, 30 seconds at a time, 30 seconds at a time, and only if we know them well, okay? The brain really isn't that capacious, the front part of my brain. And, you know, the prefrontal cortex, where I do most of my conscious thinking, if that were, the, if that were like, say, a small Amazon parcel, 
My conscious brain, by contrast, would be the size of the Milky Way. That's the kind of disparity that we're talking about. So incredibly easy to fill up my thinking brain with just a lot of noise, a lot of whatever's going on, just the smallest thing outside my door, outside my window, somebody knocks on the office door, somebody pings me on a phone, completely consumed. So that's why we have this exercise of clearing the space. Very simple, four step process. Notice what's on my mind right now. Acknowledge what that is, label the emotion and park it, which is all about giving yourself permission. Okay, so that's brain-based habit number one. The brain-based high performer clears the space. You can use this throughout your day. And like I said, as we go through each of these habits, I'd like you to think, what's the opportunity here to really use this? What would be a great trigger? And what would be my little system to implement this? So as an example, clearing the space is a habit you can start to install before every key meeting. So trigger equals five minutes before key meeting. The reward, well, actually, one of the rewards is going to be a really focused mind, calm, internal peace, able to deal with anything that comes up inside that meeting. That's going to feel pretty good. Okay. If you need a different reward, maybe it's a latte. Okay. So, brain based habit, success habit number one high performers, clear the space. I hope that will be useful for you. Take some notes on where you're going to apply that. Let's move on. Brain based. Success habit number two, the brain-based high performer welcomes any circumstance. Now, this is like a brain tattoo, okay? You want to have this as like, I just, I'm happy for any circumstance. Easier to say than to do, but again, with habit, with repetition, this becomes habit. And I love this. I love to be in a moment where this is a really challenging situation. And what I want to resist is I want to resist saying, thinking about a habit like this or a skill like this welcoming any circumstance and always doing it in the abstract always thinking yeah oh, no, okay i'll definitely do that when something comes up and then when something does come up throwing this out the window no i want to sit in that discomfort and uncertainty and think okay i really you know i keep saying i'm going to use these skills here's my chance this is a gift there's a gift in here there's a challenge in here and in challenge i really rise to the surface so brain-based success habit number two welcome any circumstance now, what does this mean in practice well first of all i want to work with resistance okay the human brain will go into that threat state let's use that as a signal that resistance that i'm onto something here something's going on something i could learn something i could work with now what's good about this that i don't see yet maybe that's a good question to write down what's good about this Another great reframing question is to say, oh, that was lucky. That's not a question. That's a statement. So that was lucky. Something we picked up, was it the Navy SEALs or the SAS? They used to have this whole thing where these terrible things would happen. They go, that was lucky. Just to shift the mind and get the juices really flowing on connection, new ideas, really getting the brain positive about the situation so we can work with it. But the key skill I want to give you here is creating versus reacting. Okay, you've heard me talk about this a hundred times, create versus react. Great work of Steve Chandler. He's one of the best in the business at this distinction. There are others too. He you know, comes from all sorts of places, but just that simplicity of that key distinction. Am I creating or am I reacting right now? So to really embed this habit, I want to have a trigger that says, okay, so the trigger is maybe a little bit of resistance or challenge or a difficult situation. And my if-then implementation rule is that I'm going to ask myself the question, am I creating or am I reacting? Or maybe better yet, what would a creation look like? So let's say somebody comes to me and says, hey, Dan, you don't know what you're talking about. You're a terrible coach. You're the worst. You're the worst in the business. I can react to that. I can create off the back of it. I can say, you know what? Thank you for saying that because nobody else has told me that. And I... I think I need that feedback. I think I need to hear that. Can you tell me a little bit more? And now suddenly I'm creating out of something that could have been a real reaction for me. And maybe you've had that in your professional life as well. Maybe you're in the office or maybe you're working on the business and you get someone really pushes back on you. Like you get a, a difficult customer or a difficult collaborator and the phone call comes through and you're thinking, should I sidestep this? I'm going to talk to that person right now. That's a reaction. Okay, that's ducking it. Now, my success habit says I welcome any circumstance. Trigger, I've got a difficult customer. Call him. 
right? If then implementation rule kicks in, let's create. What would a creation look like here? Creation would look like picking up the phone and working with this person, really understanding where they're coming from and using that to build a better service or a better level of the business or a better element that goes into our interdepartmental collaborations. Okay, create versus react. High performers, they welcome any circumstance. I hope that will serve you. Let's move on. Okay, brain-based success habit number three, the brain-based leader, the brain-based high performer elevates the thinking. Now, there is a skill called metacognition, okay? Metacognition, thinking about the thinking. One of the things I love to do in a coaching session with a client is ask, what's the quality of the thought like? What do you notice about your thinking? Is it big picture or are you down in the detail? How, what percentage of your thinking is focused on the problem right now? And you might notice with those questions, they're not about the content, they're about the thinking about the content. It's how you're doing the content. Like how often do you think about it? Once a day, once a week, every day? What's the feeling that comes up? So you're noticing what's going on. And when you do that, these great other ideas come through because it's almost like giving the conscious brain something to do whilst that lets the unconscious really come through. The insights, the new learning, that's when that starts to come to the come to the surface. So this is metacognition. Now, the habit that we want to install here is to think, if I brought 5% more consciousness to this, what would I do differently? Okay, maybe you'd like to jot that down. To elevate the thinking, if I brought 5% more consciousness to this moment, what would I do differently? So my opportunity here, the trigger, let's say, the trigger for this is, again, any challenge, and especially any time I'm stuck. Let's say I'm saying, oh, I don't know how to you know, elevate to the next level. I don't know what I need to do to win promotion. We'll go with that example. Now, if I brought 5% more consciousness to my promotion chasing journey, I would dot, dot, dot. And just finish that sentence half a dozen times, a dozen times. You know, I would make some calls. I would talk to some people. I would learn new skills. I would get into meetings. I would find out what required at the top level. I would see what opportunities there are. I would see who I could sidle with. I would see what mentors I could talk to and work with. I could see what accountability partners. I could think about champions. I could do all sorts of things if I just brought 5% more consciousness. Okay, so this habit's all about 5% more. If I brought 5% more consciousness to this, I would dot, dot, dot. Okay, so habit number three, elevate the thinking. Love you to do that with a sense of getting a little bit, um, build the skill of metacognition. I don't know about my thinking. And then think like 5% more consciousness. If I were 5% more consciousness about my project, about my learning, about my development, I would. Just finish that sentence a few times. Think of the opportunities where you can be using and installing these habits. Just make it part of your DNA, make it part of your day. Okay, habit number four. The brain-based high performer is goal-focused. Now, obvious, of course, be goal-focused. Easy to say because everybody here, are, you know, well, at one level, we're all goal-oriented. Our whole day is oriented towards goals. Question might be, whose goals are they? Mine or somebody else's? And we might also like to think about, you know, percentage that's going into the solution versus percentage that goes into problem thinking. I mean, just take a moment right now. When somebody comes to you with a challenge, right? let's, say, let's say you're a manager of a team or a leader of a business and someone in the team comes to you and says, boss, oh my God, we've got this huge problem. Now, 99% of the leaders and in the world will say, okay, listen, hey, don't worry, we can get into this. Let's really understand this problem. Let's really delve into the detail and we'll sort this thing out. But as we've talked about, problem thinking just finds more problems. You can't undo that hardwired circuitry by giving attention to the thing you want to get rid of or move beyond. So this is not so easy because the habit that we all have is to rush to the problem. Okay, I want to get back to the, or indeed rush, I interrupted myself there because I'm bing, new idea rush to the problem or rush to the solution. We should do this, we should do this, we should do this. Take a breath. That's the if then rule kicking in. My trigger is we've got this challenge. My if then rule that says be goal focused, not problems and not solutions, not yet. Be goal focused. What's the goal here? Because as soon as I say what's the goal, it elevates the thinking. That's why habits three and four are together. 
elevate the thinking, be goal focused. Those things work together. So what's the goal? And it sounds like an obvious question, but it's often not that obvious because we get caught up in the detail. We get caught up in the drama. We get stuck on the problem. We get focused on hundreds of solutions, things that we've done before, things that we've tried, things that we suspect might work without really getting back to that. What's the goal here? I love to ask this question for my kids when they come to me and say, I want, this is something I want to do. I'm always, it's this first question I go to is like, okay, what's the goal? To the point it probably irritates them a little bit. So maybe I need to find a little bit of language for that. But what's the goal here? Because that will give me so much more when it comes to thinking about the solution. Okay. There's an Einstein quote that says, if I had an hour to solve a problem and my life depended on it, I'd spend 55 minutes figuring out the right question to ask. Drop that down somewhere. It's so helpful just to keep me in that goal focused space. Okay, what's the goal here? What's the, what do I, what are we really trying to achieve? Having the outcome in mind at the outset. It's habit number four, be goal focused. I hope that will serve us. Let's move on. Okay, brain-based success habit number five, the brain-based high performer seeks optimization by subtraction. This is one of my absolute favorite insights of all time. High performance is taken away. It's optimization by removing. And where does the human brain and the human mind to go to? What can I add? What can I do more of? How can I squeeze more in? That's where we all go. The habit we want to create is what do I need to remove? And maybe just take a moment right now. What do you need to remove? What is really consuming your time right now? What is a, basically a waste of your time that's on the calendar and in your day right now? What do I need to delegate? What do I need to give over to someone? What have I become attached to that I'm just not letting go and giving to the team? What do I need to drop? What do I need to postpone? What do I just need to stop doing? And I'd love you just to take an action in this moment. Stick the word action, put a big red circle around it. Action. Create a list of subtractions that need to happen so that I can really optimize. This is my favorite performance insight because you know, it's that sense of going 80 20. I love the 80 20 rule that says 80% of my results come from 20% of the effort. Okay, I want to work out what that 20% is because that's the high return. And I want to work out what the 80% is because that's the noise that I want to get rid of. Okay, I want to get focused. I want to get back to strategically significant outputs, SSO. We talked about that in previous sessions. If that's new to you, make a personal note, ping us a note. We'll make sure we weave it into some future challenges and um, live casts. But for now, think 80 20. What's the, what's the 20%? The real bang for buck that gets me 80% of my result. Now, how can I get rid of the 80% of noise and dial up more time for the high return activities? That's habit number five, seek optimization by subtraction. Let's just pit stop for a moment. Where's that gonna be useful for you? Where's that gonna be helpful? What's that gonna help you to do? It's gonna help you to zero in on the things that you can be spending your time on. It's gonna help you to make decisions about what to say no to. It's gonna help you to let go of some of the attachments and get rid of some of the contradictions that you have in your life and in your work and on the calendar, the things you say you want to do. And then you've got this big stack of things that are going on that just don't fit with the, with the, with the success that you're looking. So build this new habit called subtraction, getting rid of. What can we remove? What can we get rid of? What can we stop? What can we postpone? Create a list, get to work, eradicating those things from your day, from your week, from your time, from your focus. Okay, let's move on. Habit number six, the brain-based high performer installs systems and in brackets, habits too. But of course, we're talking about that right now. Now, willpower is um, really about consciously kind of pushing us, like limiting ourselves, like willpower, like will myself to do something. But, you know, willpower, there is a limit to that. And you'll have noticed it. You know, there's, there's a limit to what we can achieve with willpower and that willpower like, wanes throughout the day. Don't tell my kids that. They'll ask, they'll, they ask something in the morning, definitely no. Afternoon or evening, and I'm starting to lag and my brain is taxed from the day. Oh, yeah, okay, then. Willpower is, is a finite resource. Okay. So the rule here, 
Now, and this is a brain tattoo. This is something to like just have as an operational directive. Okay, this is how I'm going to operate from here on. Don't spend willpower. Invest in habits. Okay, willpower is an expense. I've only got so much of this precious commodity, and I want to be very careful what I spend it on. Habits, that's an investment. That's something that will give you energy, give you time, give you control. Okay, so reserve the willpower for the real hard things. Everything else into the habit bucket. Okay, if you've got admin um, that you can't delegate and this happens to you, make it a habit to do that. Build up a bit of a routine around when you do that. If you've got some low level stuff like email, create a habit around it, not checking it constantly throughout the day, distracting you from your deep, um, deep work blocks, which we'll talk about soon, and your flow states, which we'll also talk about soon. Okay, put all that stuff into the habits. Systems are really about championing the consistent practice of core fundamentals. Okay, so two key pieces, figure out what your fundamentals are and then create a practice for them. And we've got some great training on that in our 10X Growth Accelerators. If you don't know about that, ping us a note, we'll let you know. But you know, habits, systems, this is all about consistent practice, core fundamentals. Those two ideas together and nothing else would revolutionize 90% of people's lives, work, and success, levels of success. Because if I could get back to the core fundamentals, which are the cornerstone, by the way, of mastery, and if I could build a consistent practice for that, and a great way to do that, a great vehicle for that would be a habit, that will make a huge difference. And with long-term um, performance, which we're all looking for, we want that long-term game that we're playing. Think about habit-based behavior change. It's the most reliable way to do it. If I want to change behaviors, let me do it through habits because they're reliable. So if you are looking to, let's say, adopt us, let's say you're running a business and inside your business, you've got a key team of like three, four people, and you want them to adopt a system or a process or a new approach that's going to elevate their performance, your performance, the organization's performance. How can we make that a habit? If you are a team leader, let's say you run um, a project team or you know, a team of business analysts or a team of technical guys, and you want them to shift up their approach and the way we do things, habits is a great way to do that. Let's imagine you're an HR person or a people person or a coach or something like that, and you want to help organizations cultivate high performance environments. Habits, create that through habits. I hope that will serve you. Let's move on. Habit number seven, one of my absolute favorites. Top class brain-based performers maximize flow states. Okay, now what's a flow state? You all know a flow state because you will have experienced it. Those moments where you are absolutely in the zone, time passes very quickly, um, you are hyper productive, you really, really make things happen. And it's a joy to be in that moment. And what if we could maximize that? Well, we can. So here's like, what is it? Maybe two, three, four key ingredients. And the first is I'd love you to get razor sharp on your sub goals. So write that down, razor sharp on your sub goals. Razor sharp speaks for itself. Absolute precision, not just sort of vaguely, I wanna, you know, I wanna work on the document that I need to, need to finish. I wanna work on chapter four of said document. Okay, just zero in on that. You can always sharpen your goals more than you've currently got them at get razor sharp and on the sub goal not the big goal to write the document or to build the business or to you know, you know develop the recruitment of our team get into the sub goals the goal the, the mini goals that contribute to the big goal to get razor sharp on those sub goals second key ingredient of maximizing a flow state is getting that challenge skill sweet spot just right if you give yourself a task that is way too easy it's not going to challenge you enough. It's going to be boring. You're going to, your mind's going to get fatigued. Okay. If it's way too hard, way too far beyond your skill level, you're going to get frustrated and overwhelmed and stressed. Think of the inverted U, the psychologist Keys and Dodson, if I remember correctly. There's a performance sweet spot. As arousal in the brain increases, the performance level and my level of focus goes up and there's a real sweet spot at the top where I'm absolutely firing on all cylinders. Too much and I tip into stress and overwhelm. Too little and it's just boredom and fatigue. Okay, so challenge, skill, sweet spot. 
Third ingredient of maximizing your flow states is getting real time feedback. Is this working? Is it going in the right direction? And I really want to create something that gets that positive internal feedback loop going. I'm doing something, I get some feedback, I tweak, feedback, tweak, feedback, get better, 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 better. And that puts me into my flow state. And this is great to be in a flow state because it really eliminates distraction. It is so easy to say no to distractions when you are in the zone. You guys know this, so let's maximize for that. We really want to have that singular focus. And to do that, we just need to remove all those lesser goals. Okay, so something you can do to help induce a flow state is get razor sharp on the sub goals, find the challenge skill sweet spot, make sure feedback is built in, but prepare the, prepare the, um, the playing arena by removing lesser goals, getting rid of distraction. Think about the best times that you love to do your best work. That's when you want to maximize your flow state. Think about that, like the Timothy Galway um, performance equation. Performance equals potential minus interference. Let's just eradicate as much interference as we can so the potential can really come through. Because all of this adds up to you and your peak state. And once again, I love you to think, what's the opportunity here? Where can I maximize my flow states? Where do I need to do more? Where am I maybe not, um, where am I letting you know, myself slip in terms of you know, total antithesis of flow states, I'm not out of flow, I'm just not in the zone, I'm really distracted, I am not switched on, okay? In that case, gives me a trigger. And in that trigger moment, an if-then rule. If I have the opportunity to drop into this flow state, then I will, first of all, get a piece of paper, get razor sharp on the sub goals, not the big goal, but the sub goal, not just vague, but razor sharp. Really give myself a level of challenge that meets my level of skill. I'm going to incorporate some feedback. So that was habit number seven, maximize your flow states. Okay. Challenge. Uh, so habit number eight, the brain-based high performer keeps score. This might sound a little bit bad. It's like, um, you know, a bit of one-upmanship, just keeping score. But this is about data, okay? This is about having data and that stuff age old adage what gets measured gets done what gets measured improves so just have performance by the numbers be your reality because everything else is a everything else that's not feeding into the core numbers is a distraction it's just noise that's not needed now if we can figure out what do we need to keep score of what makes a difference what's important so think of your project Think of the next level of success you want to achieve. Think of the things you're looking to work on right now. Think of where you want to make a change. And then think, if you were to score this, what would be the metrics? Would it be, you know, number of people that we get into the program? Would it be number of dollars in the bank? Would it be um, the number of, I don't know, the number of modules that we kick out in our training course? Would it be number of lines of code that we write and get tested and get through the system what are the metrics that you want to track track you guys are all good at tracking metrics in very professional project-based environments let's apply that to life and success what do i need to track what would be useful what gets what needs to be measured and then keep score because the brain really loves numbers it creates an internal feedback loop i love to ask you guys i love to ask my private clients on a scale of one to ten 10 being great, one being not. So how are you doing for X, Y, Z? And because we are self-scoring, we give ourselves that internal feedback loop. Where I'm at right now feels like a six. Okay, this is what a six looks like. And my next question is, okay, what would a nine look like? What do you want to get to? I want to get to nine out of 10. Okay, what does nine out of 10 look like? And that gives me some an internal feedback loop so my brain can really latch on to what I'm shooting for here. But this is also about managing our focus and our attention. You know, if I'm dialed into the numbers, I can absolutely say no to the other things that are happening around me. So success habit number eight, keep score. Think about what else in your life and work needs some numbers around it. OK, chap, um, success habit number nine. A little bit out of kilter. Here we go. The high performer promotes communication safety. Now, I couldn't not put this in because safety and specifically communications safety is so key. This is a massive and key topic. 
we'll not have time to go into great detail today. And you know, I have a whole module in my brain based leader course or our brain based leader course. There, are, I think we've probably dedicated one or two of our TSB live sessions to communications, and this is a key theme. So you can go look at those things. But for right now, primary focus here is safety. Well, I want you to think about every time you have a communication, anytime you're in a challenging situation, anytime you've got an issue, your habit now is to promote safety. Okay, promote safety. And you can do that using the in case model, which is something I have in my toolkit, you know, just in case. In case, in for inclusion, C for certainty, A for autonomy, S for significance, and E for equality or equity, so essentially fairness. Now these are five domains in the human brain, buttons that we can push to really look after the safety of someone. Inclusion, certainty, autonomy, significance, and equality. If I make somebody feel included, if I let them know what's coming, that certainty, if I give them some choice in it, autonomy, if I make them feel significant, hey, you're, you're the expert here, I'd love to get your input. Your significance goes up. And really look after the safety that's happening. And when we feel safe, we can learn, we can communicate, we can make um, great deals, we can find great solutions. When we're lacking safety, all of those things go away. I don't hear the messages coming in, I don't want to work with you. I'm resistant. I'm shutting down. So I need to be able to look after safety at all times. Now, a great way to do that is a little tool that we call placement. So a little, little side segue here, a little challenge for you in the, few, in the coming days. Every communication you step into in the next few days and weeks, I'd like you to begin with placement. I'd like you to let people know why they're here, how long we're talking for, what the topics are, and what the key outcomes we're looking for from the session. Thanks for joining me, it's 30 minutes, we're gonna talk about Project XYZ. I specifically like to look into the feedback of our big boss person. And what I'd like to get to at the end of this session is some confirmed and agreed roles and responsibilities that each of us are gonna take away and report on next week. Okay, completely different meeting from the one where we just sort of wondering, hey, how's it going? Okay, right, I suppose we should, okay, let's get into this. Let's just start talking. Okay, there's no direction. I'm not holding the space. There's no leadership there. So let's promote communication safety with this tool called placement. That is habit number nine. I hope that will serve you. Okay, last couple, and then we'll get to a special one at the end. So, brain-based success habit number 10. The brain-based high performer, slows down okay i love you to introduce more thinking and reflection time in your day in micro moments this doesn't have to be a long activity this doesn't have to derail your day but just bring in some thinking and reflection by just slowing yourself down now the trigger here is any time that i'm feeling the stress the overwhelm the pressure things are really speeding up i just want to say to myself dan take a breath I always go back to the breath. I've always got it with me. Just slow down. Okay, just slow down a moment. And what I love about this is when I do that, I always get clear on the right next action. I get clear on what the high return activity is, and I get clear on what I need to say no to. I get a chance to stop and say, whoa, 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 you know, Dan, what are you doing? Okay, you've got 10 things on, none of them are important. This is the one thing that will move you forward. These are the nine, 10 things we just need to get rid of. I can settle into that. Now that's not that easy to do because when we're under time pressure, what do we want to do? Speed up. How can I go faster? How can I squeeze more in? It's a bit like the whole sense of seeking optimization through subtraction. The human brain wants to go to what do I add? So it's what do I remove? How can I just slow myself down? So a better thought will always emerge when I'm slow and when I have that inner calm. That's habit number 10, slow down. Okay, penultimate habit. The brain-based success habit number 11 of high performers is to be complete. A high performer is complete. Now, what does this mean? Well, this means no open-ended thoughts, okay? When I leave a meeting and things aren't really decided or I 
get interrupted partway through a task, or I get up from my desk when I'm in the middle of something, or I haven't made a decision. These are all examples of very open-ended thoughts. Okay, there's something there in my mind and I haven't really closed it out. It's like an open loop. And I just keep going round and round and round because that loop hasn't been closed. It hasn't been shut down. It's been taken care of. So this habit to be complete applies to tasks, applies to meetings, applies to conversations, applies to your end of day. Let's break those down a little bit. So if I've got a task and I come to the end and I'm about to step into a meeting, so the task isn't quite finished. Okay, I would love to be complete. I can't finish it right now. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to jot down a couple of notes about where I'm at and what I'll do next. And that allows my brain just to feel complete, like a full stop at the end of the sentence. Let's go into a meeting and say, okay, what do we need to do to feel complete? Five minutes before the end, you go around each person, for example, and say, anything you want to say just to be complete? Yeah, I just want to say thank you for today's meeting. Or maybe, I, Dan, anything you want to say to be complete? I'm not quite clear on what I need to do with this thing. Can we just go over that? Yeah, you need to do X, Y, Z. Okay, got it. I'm on board. I agree. I will do that and do it for next week. I feel complete. Okay, can apply this to everything. Great place to be complete is your end of day. Everybody has a strong morning routine or at least knows about the importance of that. How many of us have a strong end of day routine? versus how many of us just kind of drift into our end of day or our day finishes when we get through enough of the list or we're so tired we can't continue or we get to a certain hour where we just have to rush out the door. Let's anticipate that 30 minutes before your scheduled end of day. Give yourself that 30 minute window to really just psychologically detach. What would you need to be complete on your day? I need to make some notes about where I'm at. I need to make a little uh, list the first thing tomorrow morning, which is a great idea, by the way. You know, prioritization is a very expensive cognitive task. Do that the night before for what you're going to do tomorrow. And the human brain can get to work on that while you're sleeping, while you're offline, while you're just away doing whatever it is, that whatever else you're doing. Your non conscious can be working on that. And the next day, no decision fatigue, no friction. Bang, I can get going. Okay, so what's your end of day to be complete? And just a final thing around this habit, just build the um, practice of noticing where you've got open loops, noticing where you've got recurring thoughts. We kind of come full circle back to the clearing the space exercise, where it's just like, okay, what's on my mind right now? Okay, I'm thinking about that open decision. And every, everything is kind of backing up behind that in the decision making cue in my mind. Okay, that's something I need to take care of. It says build the habit of noticing open loops and recurring thoughts and address them because they are real resource wasters. Okay, now, where are we? Before we get into habit number 12, let's just take a quick pit stop. Top performers, brain-based success habits, we clear the space, we welcome any circumstance, elevate the thinking, we're goal-focused, we seek optimization by subtraction, we install systems rather than willpower. We maximize flow states by getting razor sharp on sub goals and finding the challenge skill sweet spot. We keep score and track the numbers on things that really matter. We promote communication safety with the in case model, inclusion, certainty, autonomy, significance, equality. We slow ourselves down and we're complete. Now in a moment, we'll talk about habit number 12. But before we move on, 12 big habits there that I hope will really, or 11 big habits so far that will really serve you. What's been your key insight? What's been your key insight today? What's the thing that surprised you? What's the thing that you hadn't thought of before? What's the element that was there, but you just realized you'd forgotten and was useful to revisit? And off the back of those insights, what are some of the immediate changes you'd love to install? And how will that be good for you? How will you do that? And you know, as we turn our attentions to things like integration, how would I put this? What we're looking for, as always, is transformation. And how best to integrate this is, as we said, those three key elements of how to really make this happen. First of all, awareness, um, especially of the situation, especially of the reward, and to experiment with those rewards, experiment with how you, you know, what really works to motivate you in come up with success habits that you can install. Secondly, positive reinforcement. If you want to do this, if you want to keep on doing this, we want to give positive attention onto the things we want to see more of, catching ourselves doing things right. 
And finally, we want to isolate cue, trigger, the thing that kicks it all off. This is super important and what most people miss. Most people focus on the behavior. How can I change up the behavior? Focus on the trigger. Focus on what's kicking this off because that is the acupuncture point that will make the difference. Okay, so what we're going to do is in the, um, in the show notes for today's session, we'll drop in maybe four or five quick ideas on how to really implement this stuff. But I want to give you the um, final habit, eagerly anticipated, I'm sure. So brain-based success habit number 12, the brain-based high performer has a world-class routine. Now, I want to tell you that anyone can have a world-class routine. Anybody. You don't need anything special, not really, to have a world-class routine. I loved it when I really noticed this. It's like I'm looking at these elite performers, athletes, business people, whomever, and they're just as flawed as me. And they're running their day in a certain way in ways that I could just emulate. I could do that. And I was looking at, what was it? It was Tools of Titans. In fact, it's right here. Tools of Titans by Tim Ferriss. There's a great line in there about, you know, if you put enough evidence-based behaviors and habits in place, you can create any success that you like. It's one of the things that really TSP is built on. It's a very similar value that we have. But if you put in the work, create the processes, create the habits, you can do exactly the same as all the other top class people out there that you really admire. So as we step through a little bit of detail on habit number 12, having a world-class routine, two key points I'd love you to remember. First of all, that thought that the brain is limited in its capacity. Okay, We're always trying to add more. Our high performance comes from optimal subtraction. So as we step through thinking about a world-class routine, I'd love you to think about, well, what can I remove here? What can I get rid of? And the second thing I want to say about the human brain is it's very easily distracted. You know, people know the path to their success. The problem is they drift off the path. So more than half the time, the game is really distraction management. So when we think about building a world-class routine, I'd love you to think, how do I drift? And then for what changes are required. Okay, so what can you remove? How do you drift? And therefore, what are you changes are required? As I mentioned, you might like to bring, you might like to look into um, our bold boundaries challenge, challenge number 205 of February 2022. Bring a high quality no to your day, to every day. Hold those boundaries and replace discipline, so the sense of willpower with systems that was habit number six i think so you start to see how all of this kind of weaves together so just want to quickly give you maybe five six key ideas for your um for your schedule for your calendar that will really work because you know i'd love you to just take a little time to construct a world-class brain-based routine in fact that's the action i'd love to leave you with is what would a world-class brain-based routine look like for you okay it's about getting more focus time. It's about optimizing best time for key activities. It's about removing friction and it's about making these things habit. So what are some of people's challenges? Just drop them into the chat roll for a second. Um, what are some of the challenges you see on your schedule right now? Last, you know, this week just gone, the week to come. What are some of the key challenges? Drop them in so we make sure we talk in context. Okay, um, prioritization. There's a challenge, absolutely. Um, too many meetings, urgent versus important, no breaks. A few other things. Great. So I I'm sure we can all relate. We can all relate to a schedule where too many things going on. I don't want to prioritize. Everything seems urgent. I can't get to the important things. I don't have any breaks. I can't stop. I can't think. Just too many meetings, back to back. I don't have a chance to re re reset. I don't have a chance to do work really relate to those things. So I want to give you maybe five or six elements that are really going to change up your weekly schedule. Okay, so imagine your calendar, take a deep breath, and let's craft a world class routine. And I want to start with some weekly plan. Okay, the day is too small to plan. That level of planning is too small. The month is too big. Set your planning level at the level of the week. Okay, once a week in your calendar, is a weekly review and a weekly plan, okay? You set goals for the week. You're gonna check in on them on a daily basis. So you're always checking on that. How am I doing? It's like, it's Tuesday, it's Wednesday, it's Thursday. How am I doing against the goals that I set for this week that I set on Sunday, okay? And then do a weekly review at the next weekly planning session. 
how did I do? What worked? What didn't? What needs attention? What do I need to change up for this week? And use that to set your next week's goals. Okay, that's big idea number one, weekly planning. Big idea number two, have a strong daily start of day routine. And your focus here, of course, is going to be things like diet, nutrition, hydration, movement, exercise, whatever gets you charged up. But once you're to your desk, your start of day routine is about prioritization and intention. OK, and what we want to do here is we want to get clear on what not to focus on and what to let go of. That's your game changing principle here, because everybody gets to their desk and starts to prioritize and sets intentions. What I want to challenge you with from a brain based perspective is make a decision about what you're not going to focus on. today. Let's say you've got a document. Let's say it's Tuesday and you've got a document due on Friday. You know, you've got time to do it, it is priority one. But there is a other there is a side hustle that really is the thing you want to work on, the thing that will really move you forward. OK, I'm going to say I'm not going to work on that important document. And that might need a little bit of boldness. This is where our challenge, Challenge 205, comes in, because there's some boldness that's needed to hold a boundary there. So let's get clear on what not to focus on. That's big idea number two, daily start of day routine. It's really about prioritization and intention, but saying no to things and letting go of stuff. OK, big idea number three, daily end of day routine. We've already talked about this. We don't get intentional about the end of the day. We kind of drift. We kind of just finish when we finish. OK, so let's let go of that. Let's create emotional and psychological detachment from the day. So set a time in the calendar, end of every day, like half an hour, or 15 minutes before you finish. And then have the same kind of discipline about your start of day in this moment at the end of day. Really figure out what it is going to take to be complete what are the key ingredients maybe there's an email i need to quickly send maybe there's a phone call i need to make maybe there's a list i need to put down maybe there's a plan for tomorrow morning what do you need to do to be complete at the end of your day big idea number four focus time and deep work blocks talked about maximizing flow states as a new habit now when do you need a deep work block when is your best time where would you be? What are the best locations for what kind of thinking? Okay, that starts to give you a thought about where and when and what to focus on in your deep work blocks. And now let's think about, okay, what's the high priority work and the thinking tasks that I want to plug into that? Okay, so when is my best time? We carve out the time there. What do I want to be focused on? That gives me my content, those, those periods. And now what I want to do is I want to install my 6.25 principle. 6.25, 6.25% 6 of the day is about 90 minutes. The first 90 minutes of every day into your deep work tasks, your key projects that will move you forward. Once again, you're going to need some boldness here just to hold that boundary because now I'm not working on the things that I thought I was going to be, or I'm leaving a lot of email, or I'm leaving the rest of my role that I'm going to check in the, you know, the time from now. And I'm going to focus on this, but make the powerful decision. Choose what you want to work on. Make these things happen. So that's big idea number four, focus and deep work. Big idea number five, environment and tools. Do you have everything you need? Is everything that you need to really make your day flow without friction around you to hand? Do you know where things are? Have you got what you actually need? Take a bit of time to really think, what's the requirement throughout my day? What would remove the friction here? And then go find the tool that does that. And don't get too obsessed about the specifics of the tool. I used to get so crazy about all the different tools. I do like that. I do like to play with different types of pens and journals and all those kind of good things. But the most important thing is to dial into the requirement and then have the mindset and the skill set. Because the tool set, I mean, OK, there are some differences, but really it's about the mindset that we bring, holding boundaries, being focused, bringing a quality of thought. So just make sure that with all those things, you then have the tools that you need that are appropriate. Most tools will do the job. Just make sure that they are around you and your environment is set up. And make sure that you're removing the friction. Okay, that's the key element here. And our final idea in our world-class routine is energy and self-care. You cannot give what you don't have. The brain is the most energy intensive organ in the human body it weighs something like one or two percent of our tire you know, of our body weight it consumes 20 plus percent of the resources it's very resource hungry so 
sleep, rest, breaks, rejuvenation, diet, nutrition, hydration. I need water. The brain needs water more than anything else. Exercise, movement, reflection, meditation, journaling, all these things build into your energy and your self-care, and that will give you the world-class routine that you're looking for. So I hope that will serve you six big ideas for your world-class routine. Weekly planning, a daily start of day, a daily end of day, focus and deep work blocks, the environment and tools to support that, and energy and self-care to drive this whole thing. Now, I know we're running over. I hope today's been useful. Where have we gotten to? Well, we've understood the power of habits, awareness, trigger, reward, positive reinforcement. Use those insights to really build in the success habits that you're looking for. We have learned about getting intentional, about autopilot, how to use that power for good. The 12 success habits, which I'd love you to weave into your day, your week, and to your DNA. Just might make it part of who you are. And we've begun to develop and execute a world-class routine full of energy, focus, being intensely on and then intensely off. And I'd love to leave that little action, that little challenge for you to build for yourself a world-class routine. Anyone can have a world-class routine. It's up to you to go there, up there and create it. What have been your key insights today? What are your next commitments? Please complete the review feedback form. I'd love you to do that. It really helps me. Let me just drop that into the chat. There's the link. Please drop, drop over to that right now. Tell me what's working for you. Tell me what your favorite things were about today. Tell me what you'd like to see more of. Tell me what we need to um, hone down and really zero in on. If you've got questions, comments, drop them into the chat roll. Else, you know what? I wish you guys a highly productive and focused month ahead with those 12 brain-based success habits to really support you. It's been great talking to you today. I hope to see you again, guys again soon. See you. Thanks very much. Bye-bye.